All right, well, good evening, Holy Cross. Good to see y'all uh, here today for the second of our uh, Advent uh, midweek worship services. Uh, we're having some technical difficulties with the screen, so we're making uh, copies of the order of service so that uh, everybody can have it. Uh, although, with the first, we could probably get the first hymn done just because we have books. Uh, I, I heard this uh, guy tell a, uh, he was telling a story once, it was at a concert, and uh, he was saying that he was talking to somebody from one of these big churches, and, and they were like, yeah, we got this big new screen at our church, and it cost us a million dollars. And he told them, and he said, well, at my church, everybody gets their own book that, we all, that they get to use. So, you know, it's like that. Uh, but good, uh, glad to uh, have you all here as we prepare for the coming of the Christ child. So, uh, why don't you go ahead, take out the, your hymnals, and turn to uh, hymn 349. We're going old school today, baby. Yeah. Uh, and as you do that, or when you finish that, go ahead and stand and greet one another, and uh, then we'll get the candles lit and we'll go. service here distributed yeah thanks yeah so we'll wait just a second so we can get everybody ready and if your row gets extra pass them back you gotta pass it back Just about got it covered. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord. That's what Isaiah said. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not faint, wait upon the Lord. God of all mercy and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
believe and receive the good news. God sent his son, the babe of Bethlehem, to show his infinite love and forgiveness for all people. Your sins are forgiven in the holy name of Jesus Christ, who came and indeed will come again. Amen. Wait upon the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And let us pray. O Lord, rend the heavens and come down. Be our strength every morning and our salvation in the night of despair. Show forth your power and might, just as you did in the days of Isaiah the prophet. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, God forever. Amen. And please be seated for the reading of Scripture. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 to 31. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall f- fall exhausted. But they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. The epistle reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 22 to 25. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in the hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Thank you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Gospel reading from John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. That's our gospel lesson. Please be seated. I would invite the children forward for the kids' message. You guys come on down. (laughs) Okay, leave a spot for me. Okay. Y'all got it. Man, I'm so excited to see all of you guys in church tonight. I saw some of you. I saw some of you over for uh, uh, supper earlier. Uh, it's a special time of year, so we have these special times to get together, uh, and that's really a cool thing. So I want to ask you something, and I want you to think about this for a second because you might not have thought about it very much. And you can raise your hands when you have an answer. What is your favorite bird? A blue jay? What's yours? A parrot? Good choice. How about you? A dove? What do you got? The blue jay? Okay. What else? Yeah, you guys. On that side. 
A mockingbird. Okay. Stay bird, Texas. All right, yeah, you. Blue jay. Yeah, blue jay, what about you? A cardinal. A cardinal? How about you? What is it? A hummingbird. Okay. Uh, one more? Chicken. A chicken. <laughs> I love it. Good answer. <laughs> Delicious answer. Yes. Ha. <laughs> Uh, well, good. Well, uh, we read earlier a passage from Isaiah, Mr. Penn did, and I want to share, uh, share with you one of those verses. Uh, well, let's see. Here's what it says. Those who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They will walk and not be faint. So the Bible here, and it does this in other places, uh, talks about eagles, okay? So think about it for a second. Who can tell me something they know about eagles? What do you got? They have white hair on their head. If you're talking about the bald eagle, that's what it has, right? It, it, uh, and it has the, the feathers. Yeah, yeah, you. They can see very far, right? Sometimes we'll, we'll say about somebody they have eagle eyes, Right? Yeah, how about you? They have, sharp claws. they have sharp claws. They have many talons. Yes. How about you? Very, very, very strong. They're strong. Okay. Okay, how about you? They have really big, they have really big talons. That's right. <laughs> well, yeah, nobody mentioned this, and this, maybe this will be something we learned today. Uh, but uh, the, bald e the bald eagle is the national bird of the United States. Yeah, and we don't have them very much around this part of the country, but it's a big deal. Uh, and it's a big bird, too, uh, which is something cool about it, I think. Uh, if you've ever seen one in real life, and I've probably only seen a bald eagle in real life like half a dozen times. One time? Yeah, yeah. So when we're talking about a big, strong, majestic bird, this is what the Bible says is that when we wait on the Lord and when we trust in the Lord, it's like we have strength like an eagle. And it's like we can soar like an eagle. You ever thought about what it would be like to fly? Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, it'd be awesome. Okay? Uh, and so the Bible tells us that when we listen to the Lord, when we trust in the Lord, that we are as strong and powerful as an eagle. So maybe you can remember that. I'll give you one other piece of information you may not know. Do you know who one of our founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin, do you know what he thought should be the national bird? Any of the adults know? Turkey. That's right. That's right. Can you imagine if that was our national bird? <laughs> we eat it every year. All right. Uh, very good. Okay. Uh, Yes, and it's illegal to kill a bald eagle, so don't ever do that. Okay? Yeah. But they're strong, and they're mighty, and because of Jesus, we can be strong and mighty too. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, uh, help us to trust you and be strong and mighty like an eagle. We love you, Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. All right. You guys can go back by your seats and we'll sing.
May the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In the summer of 1820, there was a 10-year-old boy named Phineas, and in that, that summer, he was going to go see his island. See, because the day that Phineas was born, his grandfather presented him with a deed to some land in Connecticut. It's called Ivy Island, and for the first time, Phineas was going to go see it and play there and check it out. Can you imagine? And his parents would remind him, listen, not, not every boy gets to have an island. Neighbors were afraid that, that uh, Phineas wouldn't want to play with their children. Because when you own an island, you feel pretty important, don't you? And when you own an island, you want to see it. So Phineas hadn't seen it yet. But the day had come, the summer of 1820. They took a long ride in a horse and buggy, he jumped from the buggy, he ran through a meadow and went through some trees and looked out into the waters and he saw Ivy Island. And when he saw the island, his heart sank. Because Ivy Island was five acres of snake infested marshland. It was worthless. His father told him it was a generous gift, but it wasn't. This, it, this is a joke, right? This is a cruel joke. Phineas stood there in disbelief, and he uttered four words, four of the most haunting words in the English language when he put them together like this. But I had hoped. But I had hoped. So much pain is packed into those few words. But I had hoped. Now imagine Isaiah's anticipation when the word of the Lord came to him in 740 B.C. Isaiah wrote about the nations streaming to Zion, beating their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Isaiah wrote about a virgin conceiving and bearing a son whose name would be Emmanuel, God with us. And Isaiah gave this son other names too, wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. With such great and precious promises, everything was going to be great for Isaiah. Right? Wrong. No. Dead wrong, in fact, in the life of Isaiah. In Isaiah 29, the prophet says that God's people honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. Their hearts are far from the Lord. In Isaiah 30, he calls God's people stubborn children who have plans that are not anywhere close to God's plans. In chapter 31 of Isaiah, the prophet says that the Israelites rely on horses and trust in chariots, but they don't look to the Lord. They don't consult the Holy One of Israel. After hearing about peace and Emmanuel and a king to arrive, that's how the people are living? Can you hear Isaiah's frustration in a heavy sigh? But I had hoped. The result? Shattered hope. Dashed hope. Futile hope. What are our options? Well, we tend to become bitter, don't we? If the story that I told earlier was familiar to you, or even if it's not, do you know that Phineas, the Phineas of Ivy Island fame, became bitter for the rest of his life? In fact, he made a career out of being bitter. He made a life out of fooling people, just as he had been fooled. You don't know him as Phineas. You know him as P.T. P.T. Barnum of the Barnum and Bailey Circus. And P.T. Barnum coined the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. 
when we lose hope, we can become broken. Someone once challenged Ernest Hemingway to write a story in six words. And Hemingway came up with this. For sale, baby shoes never used. Isn't that tragic? For sale, baby shoes never used. It's a story about so much hope. Baby shoes. It's a story about that hope being crushed, never used. When we lose hope, we disappear into sadness. We know, we just know that we'll never be happy again. Life after loss doesn't follow an ordered and predictable path. It looks a lot like a tangle of a plate of spaghetti. No rhyme or read. It's just all over the place, right? On the plate. Four words consume us when we're in that state of brokenness, when we've suffered that much loss. But I had hoped. And so when life's hammer crushes our heart, we can become bitter, we can become broken, we can become, we can become bitter or broken, or we can become believing. So after the American Civil War, the College of William and Mary had to close its doors, in large part because there weren't enough students left after 600,000 casualties in that war. And so, weeds grew on the campus, roofs collapsed, windows were broken, and it was all going to be for a lost cause were it not for the efforts of one gentleman. And he would go to the bell tower every morning and ring the bells, calling students to class. Except there weren't any students. There weren't any professors. For seven years, every day, this gentleman went. His name was Benjamin. He rang the bells at the College of William and Mary. He refused to become better, right? He refused to become broken. He became believing. And the result is the College of William and Mary reopened in 1888. And it is today well known as one of the foremost colleges on the East Coast. That's Isaiah. Isaiah kept ringing the bells. And in spite of all of it, what did the prophet write? Those who wait upon the Lord <clears throat> shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. The word wait in this verse is the same Hebrew word for hope. Isn't that interesting? Do you see the connection? Biblical waiting means waiting with hope. Biblical hope means hoping while we wait. Waiting and hope. They go together. Like peas and carrots, they go together. We won't wait if we don't have hope, will we? It ain't worth it. I got other things to do. And hope won't help unless we learn how to wait. So I read earlier Isaiah from Isaiah 40, some of the most powerful words there in the Bible. The words in this verse combine waiting with hope to put a spring in our step, to put a song in our heart. They're still just words. Letters, form, ideas, figures on a page announce concepts, viewpoints, and thoughts. Had a kind of, I guess, interesting experience earlier today. One of my buddies, uh, he put on Twitter, he put, what is your favorite Advent or Christmas hymn line? Uh, and the one for him was uh, the virgin sings her lullaby. It's great. So, but he was asking people, hey, share yours. And so uh, for me, uh, my favorite line in any Christmas song is, 
from uh, O Holy Night where we say, a weary world rejoices. That's what we're getting ready for. And so other people were writing this, some of whom I know them, some I don't. And like, I'm reading this and it's bringing back these hymns to mind and it's bringing back memories. And I'm like, I'm sitting here on my phone on Twitter crying. Like, what's going on here? (laughs) But this time of year has that effect on us, doesn't it? It really does. The words matter. That's why Isaiah goes on to tell about the suffering servant who took on flesh and blood in Bethlehem. The prophet says that the servant will grow up, will one day give his back to those who strike him, will give his cheeks to those who would pull out his beard. He will not hide his face from mocking and spitting. The servant will be pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. He'd be led like a lamb to the slaughter, like a sheep is silent before its shearers. He will not open his mouth. The servant will give himself over to suffering and death, feel the Roman whip, hear the sound of the hammer hitting the nails. Hope will listen and love. It will heal and hear. Hope will have a name. Jesus. Jesus. But we had hoped. Remember the Emmaus disciples who were on the road right after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection in Luke 24? They even say, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. And after shedding his blood for all sin and all people for all time, Jesus is alive, walking with them on the way to Emmaus, a village seven miles outside of Jerusalem. Those two disciples are bitter. But we had hoped. They're broken. But we had hoped. They're in so much despair that they don't see Jesus walking right next to them. I get that. So do you, I'm sure, at times. What does Jesus do? Does he scold them? Does he berate them? Does he dismiss them? Does he demean them? No. Luke 24 goes on to tell us that Jesus made himself known through the scriptures and through the breaking of the bread that is Holy Communion. That's where Jesus delivers hope. Recently, 122 men who had suffered heart attacks were evaluated based upon their hope. And uh, I don't know exactly what the quiz looked like or anything like that, but the results were of the 25 men with the least amount of hope, 21 of them died within eight years. Of the 25 with the most hope, Only six had died after eight years. Do the math. Loss of hope increases the odds of death by more than 300%. Because you're carrying a burden. If you don't have hope, you are carrying a burden you cannot bear. And ultimately, it will break you. Loss of hope predicts death more accurately than blood pressure or the amount of heart damage or cholesterol. It's better, <laughs> it's better to eat Twinkies in hope than broccoli in despair. Go now and do likewise, right? Yeah. And th- there's a verse that pulls all this together. You know it. I read it earlier. I said it with the kids. I said it a moment ago. I'll read it one more time and and then we'll move on. Isaiah 40. Those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall soar on wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. So hope and wait. Jesus is coming down. He'll be here soon. In Jesus' good name. Amen.
So we're going to go ahead and uh, collect uh, offering tonight. So uh, the gentlemen are going to come forward and uh, we're going to pass the plates. Thank you, sir. And please stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we wait for you. More than watchmen wait for the morning. For you are the God of our salvation. O oh God, inspire us to wait for you faithfully. And give to others generously. Courage for the faint hearted. And great clarity for all in the valley of decision. Amen. And we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Ever and ever. Amen. May God give us the faith of Abraham, the hope of Isaiah, the joy of Elizabeth, and the gratitude of Zechariah. God will make us strong and courageous. Amen.